Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Shameen. So uh, I decided I need to get back on YouTube. So this is going to be one of the first videos that I make as I get back on YouTube. Uh, I want to talk about decentralization, which is something I've actually talked about um, quite a few times over the years. Um, I think it's going to be one of the major principles or prevailing themes that we see play out over the next decade and honestly, maybe even over the next century as we kind of take a look at what's going on in the world. Um, I think also that decentralization can be um, a solution to a lot of problems and issues that the world is currently facing. So I'll go ahead and get into it. So um, I'm gonna cover a few areas briefly just to talk about it. Um, Food production and supply chains is one area. Education is another area. Finances, utilities, and then also cybersecurity. So food production and supply chains is one of the uh, big ones. I mean, the um, coronavirus pretty much exposed a lot of um, weak links in our supply chains and our food production processes. And it also exposes how vulnerable people are when you take away that convenience of being able to go to the grocery store and trust that it'll be open. Or, um, you know, there might be situations where weather conditions don't allow you to travel somewhere to get food, or maybe even to where the conditions don't allow the stores to open, or maybe now even you have production plants or things like that that aren't able to operate. So, uh, you know, you saw a lot of people get more into gardening. Uh, I even started my own urban garden when the uh, quarantine first started last year and I grew my own uh, tomatoes and peppers. Uh, but um, I, f I feel like there's a trend with, um, you know, edible gardening and homesteading, <clears throat> things like that, where people are understanding the importance of being able to, you know, have your own food to be able to make your own food. I mean, if somebody can feed you, they control you. If, if, if you can't eat, you're dead. Um, in Western society, we're so far removed from the process of food. Um, like we don't even know what real food is in the Western world. Like we're not eating stuff fresh off the plant or, you know, fresh off the kill. We're eating stuff that's been processed and sent from different places where we're just very far removed from that. And it's actually very scary because a lot of people probably won't even be able to feed themselves. So that's one big area that people need to um, really look at. Um, maybe we can even have more stuff like local area farming in like urban areas or community gardening to where maybe even if you don't have the space on your own land or a house or somewhere, um, there's a place in the community that's doing some sort of you know, food production, gardening, farming. Um, next area is education. So this is another area you saw <coughs> exposed during this um, shutdowns and global pandemic with schools shutting down. You had a lot of people complaining that uh, they weren't getting the same quality of education. You had a lot of people um, resorting to homeschooling, which I actually think is a good thing. Um, I think the education system in the US and is garbage. Um, poor learning environments, curriculums, classrooms seem to be having quality issues. You know, teachers are underpaid, classroom sizes are too big. I mean, the costs are super expensive. If you look at higher education, um, tuition costs just growing in an insane amount. Then you also have the um, issue with progressive credentialism to where you have people um, that are kind of being forced to get the next degree and the next certification for these jobs. Uh, and it's uh, entry level jobs. So an entry level job 20 years ago wouldn't have required a bachelor's and years of experience, but literally many entry level jobs these days actually require like two plus years of experience plus a degree. And it's like, damn, where are they supposed to get this experience from? So there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna change with education. 
Um, we're going to see a lot of online learning, distance education, and homeschooling. Um, we're going to see some focus on skill building and vocational training. Like, for example, after I got laid off um, from my business development job in 2019, I took some courses in content strategy and SEO. I did an SEO mentorship and was able to get a job at an agency and then recently switched agencies this year to an even better position. So just li literally doing that focus on an actual skill or area of knowledge <clears throat> is able to, you know, get me a full-time job working at a good company, making more than the average American just off my full-time income. So uh, that I have no college, or I have no bachelor's degree you know, anybody can literally learn some of these skills and put themselves in the marketplace. Um, so apprenticeships and mentorship programs are going to be big. I think we really need to make a push for this, um, especially in the black community, but across the board to start embracing apprenticeships so the younger generation can learn from the older generation. It doesn't necessarily need to be four years of college or a bunch of general education. It could be like, hey, once you're 16 years old, you go, you know, with your uncles or some other men in the community that have professions or skills that they can teach and you take them on almost as like an internship, but, you know, apprentice or mentor programs. Um, another area that's going to be big is finance. So DeFi, of course, decentralized finance is going to be um, big, uh, you know, we saw with the whole Robin Hood fiasco and GameStop um, controversy that, you know, these financial institutions, well, they're corrupt. They've always been corrupt. The reserve banking system is not um, sustainable. The debt is not sustainable. The inflation is crazy. Um, I mean, we've already seen places in Africa uh, Venezuela, where people turn to Bitcoin, like Nigeria, Venezuela, and India are some of like the biggest places that use Bitcoin or do the most cryptocurrency transactions because the local currencies um, often aren't that strong. Um, Venezuela, for sure, had their whole collapse that they're dealing with. So um, even here in the U.S., we experienced a coin shortage last year, and 22% um, of U.S. dollars that are currently in circulation now were actually created in 2020. Um, so we have a huge issue with the money supply. The monetary system itself is, um, it's, it's not, it's not working or maybe it's working, um, but it's working as intended by the people who designed it, but it's not working for the average person. As you can see with the cost of living and these inflation costs and all these prices going up and not matching income and the consumer pricing index or any other things that we track. So, I mean, you have cryptocurrency and blockchain obviously are huge now. Um, Bitcoin is huge now. You have decentralized exchanges like um, Uniswap and SushiSwap and things like that. Um, one inch exchange. Um, you know, people are getting on these different blockchain protocols. So these decentralized financial protocols that utilize blockchains, they can eliminate the human element. So the greed and the corruption. If you have everything built into um, a smart contract, um, you know, you take out the middleman and you take out the person who's possibly going to mess things up. Uh, so if we can figure out ways to create these systems of finance and um, wealth accumulation and banking that are better than what we currently have available, I think we're going to see a huge shift. We're already seeing a huge shift, and that trend is only going to continue. I mean, people have been calling it out for years, and it's only going to become more prominent over time as the entire crypto space continues to grow and establish itself in blockchain technology becomes more widely adopted. <clears throat> so another area of concern um, is utilities, power generation, water, gas, electricity, basic infrastructure, uh, which 
maybe decentralization, uh, decentralization is the answer to that as well. Um, I mean, look what happened in Texas recently with the uh, uh, storm that they had where all the electricity was gone, pipes start freezing and bursting, you know, the infrastructure wasn't able to deal with the conditions. Uh, the United States in general has a huge, huge infrastructure problem. The infrastructure in the United States has been lagging for years and it hasn't really been addressed. It's way behind um, other countries that you think it would be able to compare to. Um, so um, globally, I think that this is gonna be the answer in places like Africa where uh, most people still don't have electricity in Africa. So, um, you know, if we can look at like decentralized power generation and decentralized utilities, um, maybe that can be a better way to deliver these services to people globally. Um, you know, I think it is an aspect of sustainability and maybe even smaller scale, like instead of one power plant powering, like, you know, a whole, you know, state or region or, you know, or basically having one grid for a whole state or region, maybe smaller micro grids. Um, definitely as technology advances with solar technology, um, Elon Musk's company was working on those, um, what, were, what were they called, the power stations, which were basically supposed to be kind of portable or at least self-sustaining power systems for, you know, to power a whole house. So imagine if we were able to truly have decentralized power generation like that in convenient ways, we could revolutionize the world, we can deliver it to Africa. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at it. Um, I think that is very dangerous to um, have too much of the um, critical infrastructure decentralized because one point of failure means everyone's screwed. <clears throat> so uh, cybersecurity is one of the last things that I'll touch on. And um, it's going to be another huge, huge area. Um, a focus over the next decade and century, for sure. I mean, look what just happened with the recent solar lens hack, uh, <laughs> where pretty much everyone got hacked. Um, you know, we've been seeing this hacking issue um, grow and grow for years, you know, as technology gets more sophisticated. So are the criminals and really, especially now after COVID with everyone being forced to go more digital, we have um, we have a lot more institutions and organizations and even individuals on a personal level that are moving more and more information online. More things are being done on the computer, mobile phones, and online in general than ever before. So it's just going to create more vulnerabilities. You know, they have they talk about the IoT, which is the Internet of Things, which is basically the idea that soon almost every device will be connected. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily going to be the answer. <coughs> um, you have, of course, blockchain technology, which I think is going to kind of revolutionize the tech space. It's already doing it so far, um, but we're only seeing the beginning. Like, nothing, we haven't seen anything yet. Um, blockchain technology is going to be huge. Um, for security, I think private blockchains is going to be important. Um, but also just the public ledger and smart contract and verifiable transactions and speed of transactions is going to help with a, a lot of things. Um, we're going to have to look at closed systems versus open systems and kind of that ties into the whole IoT thing or the whole on-premise versus, um, versus hosted or cloud um, to where it's like, okay, do we have this stuff? Do we have a kind of closed system that's um, compartmentalized or are we are we just out there and we're going to figure out a way to secure ourselves in an open network? Um, we might start looking at better storage silos and compartmentalization of data. I mean, the cybersecurity is going to be a big area. So um, that's pretty much it as far as these areas. I think if you really look at all of the things I just spoke about, all of these areas and all of these themes are going to be major themes and major issues to tackle and major things that governments and corporations are going to be addressing and working on over the years. And also I think as we see what's going on in the world with the globalization versus the um, 
nationalists for slash isolationists um, perspectives and with um, you know some countries um, closing off their borders, some countries opening up to immigration. There's a lot of changes going on. Um, and I think with how we interact with government and even how we view the government is going to be changing over the years and decentralization, especially if it can be applied, you know, privately or, you know, if it can be done privatized, it's going to be a huge way for people to take their power back. So hopefully that was a good, good enough breakdown of what I think about these, um, you know, how decentralization is going to apply over the next 10 to 30 to even 100 years. And, um, you know, until the next video, I'll talk to you guys then.